<coughs> look down a little for us. Oops, wrong button. Good morning, Willem, from the Netherlands. Thanks for joining us today. I am a little surprised this has fallen off this quickly coming down the saddle. I wouldn't have expected that. Ooh, that's beautiful in the still cam. Yeah. Oh, and a crinoid. Crinoids, one brittle star, oh, three yeah. crinoids, one brittle star. Good eye on that third one. I think it might be four. Oh, oh yeah. Yep, I think you're right. Yeah. And then there's like a little coral or something in the background. Yeah, there's a little paramour suit on there. All right, science is happy, thanks. All right. Why do you run, what is the, does the auto exposure settings just not work on it well? No, yeah, so I have to change the ISO every time. That's a very small aperture setting too. Try not to change too many of the settings. So the information that we're gathering on this dives is being uh, used to kind of compile a baseline of information for this area. And this area is being considered, or up for consideration for a marine national sanctuary. The public comment stage just ended on June 2nd. So this information is kind of coming at a key point. So this looks like a Bolasoma sponge uh, with an, an anemone below it. Push in this a little bit, Daryl. happy. Okay, go away.
That's kind of interesting. I would assume that the the sea star ate that patch off the middle of the of the bamboo, but it's down at the base, and I don't know how it got up there. If it had taken that center section off, maybe it looks it like fell. me after Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, can you give me tight there? It almost looks like the tissue's been ripped off and is hanging loose, but still alive. Yeah, can do. Hold on there, let me get a little closer. Because that skeleton is bright white. It looks like it hasn't been exposed that long. Okay, push back in there. Yeah, it looks like oh. the, something contacted hmm. it and slid it off. All right, cool, thanks. And then a little bathopathies there on the rock beneath it. So video of the uh, specimens that were collected as it's being processed in the wet lab is shown always, almost always, um, as they're working it through right then. So in a couple hours, around 8.30, probably around 9 o'clock-ish, um, you will be able to see the scientist processing the samples that we've collected from the deep sea. And part of that process is taking snips of various corals, of various samples, uh, preserving them in jars or vials and sending them off to scientists and organizations around the U.S. and the globe. Yeah, the way we archive the samples here is all the all the samples, primary samples, uh, go to the Museum for Comparative Zoology at Harvard, and they operate a lending program, so as soon as they're um, put in the archive and gotten into the, the Harvard system, researchers from anywhere in the world can request a loan and get the sample shipped to them to work on. Um, so all the samples we collect here uh, are, are publicly available to researchers globally to work with. Is there a way to tell how old these corals are from observation, or does that have to be done in a lab? It has to be done in a lab, and, it, and it's pretty destructive because you want the oldest part of the coral, so you need the base where it's the thickest. Um. What dating method do they use? I don't know off the top of my head. I can go find the paper for you, um, but I don't remember what they used. looking corals up on those boulders.
Coralie, is there a way to date rocks, or is it just looking at the ferromanganese crust? Um, yeah, so that's what we're trying to do with the basalts. Um, there's a couple different dating methods that you can use, but uh, you need to have good minerals to be able to do it, uh, which is kind of hard for this area since these seamounts are so old, um, a lot of the basalt is going to be weathered. I'm good with these, thanks. Right. Like we were, pre uh, looks like we've got to the saddle in between the two peaks and are starting to work up the next peak a little bit. Yeah, this community is so da uh, bamboo dominated. I mean, we're seeing a few other things, little bathopathies, and whatever this whip black coral we've been seeing off and on this whole expedition. And there's a, an occasional Chrysogorgia, crazy original Gorgia, Irida Gorgia, but um, really it's all about the bamboo corals up here. If one of the branches of the corals falls off, can it regrow a hold fast around that arm, or is that arm just going to eventually die? I suspect the arm would most likely just die. It's very hard for corals to get food that low uh, out of the water. So the, the metabolic load of maintaining that much tissue while regrowing a new hold fast, if it even has the pathways to do it, which I don't know, would be really difficult. Is that That's a quite the sponge? Yeah, I was going to say, is that a sponge stock? Yep, it's a big one. Looks like the current is still pretty much out of the due north here. What is that giant bone? Oh, I think it's sponge. Oh. What is that giant sponge? <laughs> So is a whip coral the same species as the other corals, just growing out differently, or is there a completely different species? So, sorry, whip, whip is not a specific coral, it's a morphology, it just means very much any unbranched, long, um, single, I don't know what to call it, it's just, um, you know, a single, long strand skeleton with no branches, and so, uh, it can, we branch, uh, whip corals can be any 
family, well, pretty much all the families except Chrysogorgia have, um, actually they even do too, um, have a, a whip morphology. So it can be a bamboo, it can be a primnoid, it can be whatever. Whip just purely refers to the growth habit of uh, the coral, meaning no branches and tall, basically. Awesome, thank you. You can keep her going, Lynette. Doesn't look like we're at the bottom quite yet. So the whole time we've been on watch, we really haven't practically changed depth much at all. We're still right in the 18, 1800s, low 1800 meters. Um, so all of this has been more or less the same depth. We've taken, for the most part, there's kind of two like local peaks here as we're at the summit uh, of this ridge type um, seamount. And we basically took a circle around the easternmost peak um, and now we're headed over transiting towards the westernmost peak um, kind of more or less in the center of the feet, uh, center of the ridge, where it looks like we're a little off to the south side, just a touch here. But it's hard to tell with the local, but the, the what we're actually seeing in the ROV, the local movement is uh, or local changes in um, angles. What I'm looking for is uh, smaller resolution than we have in our our bathymetry. but we're continuing to stay in this um, fairly high density bamboo community um, with a few other corals thrown in. A couple of our shoreside scientists um, have commented that this community feels very similar to um, a community that they documented um, in Papanamakuakea National Marine Monument uh, north in the Hawaiian Islands. And I've seen communities similar to this, not necessarily in bamboos, but uh, these um, kind of single um, group clusters where it's all bamboos. One place in particular stands out um, over around Howland and Baker um, it was much shallower. We found just this absolute forest of Caligorgia, uh, which is a type of primnoid. And I think it was like 150 meters by like 80 meters um, with the corals just basically touching each other's tips. Uh, it was an amazing thing. And there was no, not a single other type of coral in there. It was a complete monoculture. yet still no cephalopods. I really want to find one before we head back, like uh, before the expedition is over with. Can we actually look up here, whatever that is? Roger. Right 
So this is a hydroid. We collected something similar to this, and they normally have um, on this expedition. Seem to in this area seem to have um, egg cases. It looks like there might be the remnants of one, maybe two egg cases there, but they're on the other side. So we can get a good look at them. A couple of crinoids. All right, thank you. I like right there. It's like a psychocalic sponge here. Can you check that out? I think that's. Go ahead. ahead. like it's probably a rock pen. Um, yep, it's a rock pen. That's the first one I've seen up here. Can zoom in a little tighter there real quick. All right, great, thank you. Okay. Zoom in there real quick, Joe. Okay. So this bamboo looks like it's probably fallen over and is not doing so healthy, but still has a fair amount of live tissue on it, even though it looks like it's dying off. Okay. Morbid curiosity there on my part. Death is an important part of life.
tube and enemy hanging out in the sediment there. Oh. A little more coral livery here. Yeah. These Coney Astrid sea stars appear to be the dominant um, coral ore down here, pretty much all across the Pacific, Central Pacific, from what we can tell. They make up the majority of the coral 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 livery incidences we see. Do we know of these, uh, not particular species, but family or kind of stars anywhere else in the world besides the Pacific? Uh, the family, I believe, is global. Uh, How far to the next peak? Right where your cursor is. A bit over 200 meters. Okay. Try to zoom there, Daryl. I don't know if we'll get it. Oh, I got too close and ran away. Sorry, can go wide. Breeze. I think we got what we needed back here. Roger. Now, if, are we at the northernmost extent of the direction of travel we can make, or can we angle a little bit more to the north for the next move? We can make a little more north. If you don't mind, let's do that. I think sure. we're getting a little low on the backside. I need to wake people up for breakfast anyway, so.
question about the Wi-Fi situation on board. We do have Wi-Fi. That giant golf ball stuck on the back of the boat is for our internet and Wi-Fi and telepresence. For the most part, we have decent Wi-Fi. We can't stream movies or uh, YouTube, but for the most part, yeah, we get pretty good Wi-Fi out here. Yeah, it's shockingly good. Yeah. What's the password? <laughs> but I'm Bridge now. I would say it's the best of any ship I've ever been on. Can we try three zero meters to nine five? Better than Okeanos Thank and Falkor? Yeah. yeah. Even the other television ships, um, the Wi-Fi is more limited. Yeah, it's amusing when I when I'm doing shallow water coral reef work. Yeah, I, uh, even though I'm on land, I often have worse connectivity than I'm used to having now out on these ships. It seems kind of funny. Yeah, the internet at Palmyra is way worse than. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Oh, Starlink on Palmyra. Um, hopefully, we're going to be getting it this summer, but it's not a for sure thing yet. transit today is going to be a bit bumpy. We're headed almost due east right into the swell. So we're going to have a nice pitchy day. Sounds like good sleeping to me though. You like sleeping and pitching? <laughs> Something about the movement of the ship. It's a lot better than being up staring at a computer. So for those doing that, I feel sorry. These purple sea urchins we've seen a, a few times. We collected one uh, three dives ago, I believe. They are mildly venomous. They have sharp spines and they're mildly venomous. So we have to be really careful handling them. And they're really annoying to preserve because their spines punch through most of our sample bags. We have to put them in a rigid container, which just uses a lot more preservative and takes up a lot of space in the lab. We've got another little bath of pathies down the rock and then a big coral with lots of associates behind it. getting up here on the flat top of the second peak here. We're not quite to the very, very top, but we're certainly in where it's starting to flatten out a little bit. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven brittle stars, one barnacle, one or two feather stars. Bridge, nav. All right, great, thank you. I'm 
surprised it's thinning out up here a little bit. I would have expected it to have been thickening back up. Wow, is that the size of that coral that's coming into view up yeah. here? It looks unbelievable. You can kind of see it in an Atalanta view, yeah, too. Yeah, absolutely. So just remember those lasers are 10 centimeters apart. Bamboo? Yep, I think it's the same bamboo. But so, to give you an idea of what we're looking at, Hercules is currently 1.2 meters altitude and then a couple meters tall, and that sponge, or some coral, is as tall as is still about vehicle height with the altitude right now. So, that's a three meter plus coral. Jeez. only imagine how old something like this is. It's so got to be thousands of years old. So size related to age? Generally? Not I mean, I don't know if directly, but certainly they, you know, they grow slow, and so it takes a long time to get this old. I suspect we can find small old corals that are in less productive spots that just aren't growing as quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, it takes at least a thousand years to grow a coral like this, I'm sure, and probably a couple. We've got the same kind of associate mix we've been seeing, brittle stars, a couple crinoids. Can we take a, a look at the base, please, and get us get, uh, the lasers on the base of it? Sure. <coughs> I have to back away a little so it doesn't yep. get in the bumper bar. Right yeah, he's already at terminal velocity, so he's fine. <laughs> <laughs> you can see it sticking up above uh, yep. Hercules it's in totally. Atlanta. Coral is substantially taller than Hercules. Uh, push in on the base there for us. It's quite a thick base as well. Good. Yep. Wow. So the stock base is probably a good six, seven centimeters, and the, the overall tissue is probably in excess of 10 or right at 10. There's also a jellyfish that just passed from the still cam. Yep, great. All right, thank you. I think we're good here. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, Coral, did you say something? Oh, just there's a jellyfish or some sort of gelatinous thing floating oh. through. I am really surprised that we seem to be running kind of out of the corals up here. I did not expect that. They must prefer that other ridge. Yeah. This one is, is broader and flatter. Do you think it could have something to do with the currents delivering recruits? Absolutely. Unquestionably. Well, do we want to call it here or do we want to make one more move? One more move works for me. Oh, there are the corals. We're just in a little <laughs> spot. <laughs> they just don't like this particular spot. But out in the abyss, there they are. 
A big guy was hogging up all the food. Yeah. <laughs> huh. And you wanted us to call it. <laughs> I'd say I wanted. Starting a conversation. Question online, where's the control van? So if you look at a picture of the Nautilus, right in front of the big satellite, the big golf ball looking thing, you're gonna see like a big white square. That is actually where the control van is located. And the halosaur up in the water column on the right. Oh. No. Come down five for me. Thank you to the sweet comment somebody left saying, happiness is watching the Nautilus exploration page. Another giant. Come up a few meters there, get double digits. Nice shot though. Oh, this is like a cool view from out Atlanta. Yeah. Let's just highlight that. on this one's even thicker than the base on the last one. Try to zoom in there, Daryl. We'll get the lasers on the base. Okay. Good, thanks. Get a polyp shot on the one on the left. Uh, the little guy? No, the big one. Right there. We just we just got the lasers on. I just want to get a. What is this one? I, is this I mean, it's a bamboo, but it it the looks polyps. different. Yeah. Because the other one, the polyps look so. What was and it? Bushy. Yeah, and it might just be all the polyps are retracted on this one. Oh, okay. Um, Pulls in there. Yeah, all the pops are just buttoned up tight on this one. It's full, I guess. That Is that a thing? Can <laughs> corals get full? I mean, they, <laughs> they clearly choose to retract their polyps. Um, and I would assume it's generally when they're either scared or don't want food anymore. Uh, it's beautiful flying. Science is good. Okay, I can go ahead, thanks. So. Couple of real sweet messages from those coming in online. So thank y'all guys for all your support.
<laughs> Look to your left a little for me. The ship is done moving, so we can maybe explore what your tether will allow and come up. All right. It Sounds like a plan to me. Stretch it out here for recovery. There's some more big ones. Yeah. Come up a little bit. Look to your left somewhere. Such a beautiful way to end the dive with these giant old these old giants up here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I like that old giants. I feel like they only use that when they talk about trees. <laughs> No, you can just hold, we're gonna stretch it out and then start recovering. Yeah, you can come uh, whatever way it takes that half turn out. Maybe the 
other way. I can never remember. I gotta. Can you get around now? Well, thanks everyone for exploring with us this morning. Uh, we are just getting into tow formation and they're going to leave the bottom. We had a wonderful dive coming up from nearly 3,100 meters all the way up to 18. Darryl, can you uh, uh, on this deep ridge feature? Iris down there for a minute. And uh, really met the objectives here uh, for this dive of getting a lot of samples deeper than 2,500 meters um, and looking at the the corals and sponges that live down there that are really underdocumented um, compared to the other areas around this part of the world. Um, and then found a really nice high density uh, bamboo community up here on the, the summit. Um, and this also gave us our first look at what a ridge type seamount uh, in this area looks like as compared to all the geos uh, we've been diving. Push the porch so out for me. Despite us being in this really beautiful community, we're gonna go ahead and recover here um, so that we can rush over to our last geo of the trip um, over in the easternmost corner of U.S. waters around here and try and squeeze in two more dives before we have to head back to Honolulu. Um, one will be shallower uh, with the laser dive bot back on board uh, and then one, uh, hopefully if we have time, deeper one to get a sense of uh, the community that lives deeper than what the laser dive bot is currently rated to go. Um, do we need to trip an Eskin? Uh, we got one on the other, the top of the other uh, feature, and this the community here hasn't changed. Oh, for the blank? Well, we can't shoot a blank here with all of this around. So I think we're good on that front. We have plenty of samples to process today. Thank you to the Salish Sea. Um, community and Everett's Ocean Research College Academy. Thanks yeah. for joining us. Yay, Northwest. <laughs> uh. So we're just going to do a little housekeeping here, get the vehicles in formation, and then we will uh, be up in the blue water. Freeze fail. I'll do something about that tape too. Uh, what do we got in the front box there? Um, we got um, a base of a coral or a sponge. We got some bamboo coral. Is it, is it floaty, floaty stuff? Um, kind of. And a sea pen. Yeah, the sea pen in there might be, might be floaty. All right, I'll just hold it. Uh, yeah, we can do that on the way up. You could probably put it in either of the outer outboard and starboard boxes would be would probably be yeah. oh no nope, there's a seat pin in there too never mind i'll uh yeah i will play with it on the way up okay. i just realized i neglected to secure the slurp there
Okay, give me uh, probably 20, 20 meters a minute. As we're starting our ascent, we have a question online. How long does everybody stay with the with the ship? Multiple expeditions, multiple months? Uh, that really depends on... Um, Who, role. every individual person. Yeah, right? role, role and thing. So the ship's crew, um, a lot of time spends most of the field season uh, on the ship. Mm -hmm. um, the scientists come and go. Um, we only sail generally one leg at a time. Um, the mappers in the ROV team are kind of in the middle where they'll sail multiple legs, um, but not generally the whole field season. Um, the interns come and go, so it really depends on um, the different role you are occupying on the vessel and how much time you spend on the vessel. Yeah, Dan, you're out here for like three months straight. Yeah, I've been here since April. Oh. You should be able to turn off your auto heading now. When I uh, was ship's crew Disable on trusters. Okeanos, I think I joined the ship in late January and didn't get off until September. <coughs> and I would only go home for like a week and then be right back on the ship. The ship was my home. I didn't have a, uh, didn't have any other home. I only lived on the ship for two years. I guess I, I, don't know. I had a, I did have a couple short-term rentals when we were in port for more than a week or two. I would find somewhere I could crash for off the boat, but I didn't have a permanent home other than the ship for a couple of years. Wow. Is it hard getting used to that lifestyle? I do. No. It was it actually it was it wasn't hard getting used to the lifestyle. It was hard keeping up with that lifestyle. It got old. Yeah. I always feel like I need like a day or two of decompression time when I get back on land. Like just sleep for one whole day and then another day to just like slowly reintegrate back into society. Oh, well, I would often sleep the first day in port here as well um, after the thing, but it also um, you didn't have to reintegrate in society. We were just living on the ship and it was still <laughs> being at sea. Very, very true point. I forget which author, maybe it was Hemingway, but some famous author has a funny, uh, an interesting paragraph about sailors, and I'm, never, I'm not going to get the quote at all right, but it's something about the effect of people think sailors are these super adventurous people who go all over the world, but we're more like snails because we take our homes with us everywhere we go. Um, and I always <laughs> felt like that was apt. Maybe as I continue to read 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, I'll see some more like good phrases like that. I'm halfway through it. Are you enjoying it? I am, I am. It's a fast read. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, just because it was written so long ago, and so the cadence of it is very different than modern books. Um, the characters are very different than modern characters. I don't remember, I'm trying to remember, I, I'm far, I find it hard to believe I haven't read it, but I don't actually remember reading it. So maybe I should read it again. It's very, like it's really a fast read. Just reading it 30 minutes a day and I'm halfway through it.
But it's kind of interesting because so much of what they're talking about is what we do today. Underwater viewing, um, submarines. Wanting to just like get away from modern society and create your own utopia. And I know it's Dr. Ballard's favorite book. So during this dive, we sampled several sea pens, several pieces of coral, a couple of rocks, a uh, niskin for eDNA, a lot of different stuff, a lot of unique organisms. We got 22 samples for the dive. Jeez. Is that a record for this expedition? Yes. Yeah, I, I generally try and be light on the physical sampling whenever possible. Um, but given the depth we were operating in and how little waste had been explored and the likelihood of new species, range extensions, and new records for this area at that depth, we, we really prioritize sampling in the 31 to 2500 meter range on this dive. And we collected a lot. some blue water. Okay, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Six more days, not including today. Corley, were you able to finish your um, poster presentation for the ferromanganese conference, or ferromanganese, when you go in um, France? Oh, sorry. Sorry, my headphone wasn't on. Yeah, no, sorry. I didn't even notice that. Did you finish your poster? No, very far from finishing, unfortunately. But we'll get it done eventually. And that conference is Goldschmidt. It's in Lyon, France in July. If anyone is going, I'll be presenting my poster on Monday. So come say hi. <laughs> uh, but if you're not going to be in person, I'm also uploading the poster. Uh, so if you're joining virtually, you can also come see it. And you said you got this, uh, your data from other expeditions to this area? Yeah, so uh, I'm working with data from three Nautilus cruises, two from 2019. Um, and then one from uh, last year, the last time we were in Kingman Palmyra. So that's NA 110, 114, and 137. Any interesting takeaways? Um, I mean, I'm sure for you it's all riveting. 
Very interesting takeaways. Uh, I'm specifically right now looking at rare earth element partitioning between the crust and the water. And it's gonna be the first chapter of my paper. So be on the lookout for that. Uh, depending on when I write it, hopefully I'll get it done. First draft done this summer, but if not, just hopefully by the time I finish my PhD, it'll all be done. Yeah, but the, I tried to follow the thing as I, I told myself I was going to write the papers for the journals first and then convert them into dissertation chapters. Mm -hmm. And that worked for the most part. I will say at the very end, my fourth chapter, really, actually it was really my last two. So it worked great for two chapters where I had the manuscript ready to go before I kind of put it in dissertation form. And then I got a little goal oriented about being done and just mm. did the last second two chapters straight into this dissertation form. And now I need to adapt them back out to journal form. So URA actually has a pretty um, interesting way to do things where you can either do dissertation form or you can choose to do a manuscript option. So if I publish the chapters, I don't need to change them. Right. I just submit what I published. Oh, that. Cool. Th that was, yeah, that's pretty similar. Okay. Um, I will say like the first one, I, I just literally reformatted and copied, copied and pasted and reformatted chapter one. Chapter two um, was more or less pretty similar to that. Um, I, chapter three and four, I kind of just dumped everything I had done and I yeah. need to probably reduce it down and clean it up a little bit. But yeah, BU lets, lets you just verbatim, where I don't have to, it didn't have to be a cohesive thing, but I was surprised at how much annoyance just the reformatting the papers was to get them into just the dissertation format alone was annoying. Yeah, because you have to, because for some reason at URI, it's kind of annoying. And I'm sure every school is like this, because I think I've heard about this at other institutions as well. Um, you have to format it the way that they would bind it because they want to bind everything. So you have to <laughs> format it in a way where it's really far to the sides, so they have enough room to, yep. but but they don't actually bind anything because everything is digital now. Oh. I am getting mine bound. Mm. I wanted a hard copy. Oh, you? Yeah. It was like 50 bucks or something to get a print it and bind it. So I, I went for that. But you're right, absolutely right. Is they don't make it, but you still have to have the weird like two inch margins and yeah. stuff like that. I had one table that was supposed to be printed sideways, and I could just never get the margins or the page numbers right on that one. It, was, it just took me forever. They kicked it back to me like three times, like, no, your margins still aren't right on this one table. <laughs> it's the bureaucracy of getting a PhD. <laughs> But now you're a doctor, so. It's true. Congratulations. Thank you. You won't be far behind. Well, let's see. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you just finished your comprehensive exam, so that's a major milestone. It is. It's, yeah. Now I just have to do my proposal defense, um, which I'm hoping to do in the fall, and then write my dissertation. Fair warning, this was like the lowest point of my PhD. The, this? The, the right where you are? Yeah. They just finished the, <laughs> comprehensive just exam. finished the conference exams and then looking forward at the entire monolith of the dissertation, that was my lowest point. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure everyone in their third year of PhD has that, yeah. oh my gosh, I need to master out, like what am I doing yep. with my life? Yep. You know, all of my friends and um, in grad school are, are at that point right now, so. Yep. Well, we, we, all my friends did the same thing right at the third year. It was pretty miserable. I was lucky enough to go to a conference in March right before I took my comprehensive exams. So for everyone, or if anyone is wondering, a comprehensive exam is essentially this exam where your committee, and then I don't know what for you, but for URI, you have to have an outside member, an extra member on your, or like who's gonna be on your dissertation committee. Um, and it's two hours and they get to ask you whatever questions they want to. Hopefully you have some idea of the questions they'll ask because um, there's two parts to the test. There's a written component, so I get 
I got a question from each of my core committee members. So it was four days. I had 24 hours to answer each question. And then it was like the next day at 9 a.m., answer the first question, turn it in by 9 a.m. the next day. At 9 a.m. the next day, get the next question. Um, so that was pretty intense. Um, Man, that's awful. That sounds so horrible. That's it was, very, very tough. It was definitely rough. Um, I think the one that took me the longest was Adam's question. Uh, he asked me to write a, he gave me a study area, which is Kingman Palmyra, so it was around this area, and asked me to design a cruise plan. Being on station, he gave me a certain amount of berth. He gave me Hercules, Sentry, and a ship that could do multi-beam. And uh, asked me to write out kind of like my plan for the 21 days. And it just took a lot longer than I thought <laughs> it was going to take. <laughs> and so I think I finished. I like took a, after I got all the science background done, and then I was just like, OK, like what am I going to do each day? Like what time? Um, what vehicles am I using? I was like, oh, that's gonna be easy. So I'll just take a little break, like eat some dinner, like, w you know, whatever, um, and come back to it. And uh, <laughs> no, I was up until 5 a.m. that night finishing oh, no. it. I know, and so I didn't want him to see that I finished it at 5 a.m. So I, on Google, you can schedule send things. So I schedule sent it to send at 8 a.m. So it looked oh. like I woke up at 8 a.m. and <laughs> sent it again. <laughs> but, yeah, that, that's um, a lot of work. I mean, no, I, yeah, I it was, was. That's what I used to do professionally for Noah. And, and that would take me, you know, six months to plan a cruise like oh that. My gosh. <laughs> But, um, but it was fun. I thought it was like a really good learning experience. Um, but then anyways, after you do your written exams, then you have an oral exam, which is when they're all in a room with you. And for two hours, they pretty much just get to ask you whatever questions they want. Um, it could be, you, it should be somewhat based on the questions, uh, the written questions, but you know, who knows? Question, I've heard of questions coming kind of out of left field before. Uh, so that was, I've, it was like, if you have test anxiety, performance anxiety, like any of those anxieties, this is like not an amazing <laughs> test for you to take, but uh, got it done. It was kind of like that thing where immediately afterwards you feel so stupid. I just, you know, I've never felt more stupid than immediately after that test. I. But right before I w took that test, I went to a uh, science communication and science policy conference. And uh, it was so good for me to go to that conference before because I was feeling really down about, oh my gosh, I'm not going to pass the test. They're going to ask me to master out, you know. Um, so it was good to just have something, you know, like, oh, like, you know, it, something to like mm -hmm. push motivate you, like, you. yeah, motivate you in your career. And also that conference was a triple AS conference. They have them every March. So if anyone is interested in anything related to science or science communication or science policy, highly recommend that conference. No problem. I'll be right there. I got to go to the SIGBE conference and present there in January. So that was the Society of Comparative and Integrative Biology. Holy moly. That is a... A very big, very intense, very cool conference to where like everything's kind of grouped together and I've never seen it done in that format. So it'd be like, all oh, the dolphin people, you go to this one. All the uh, starfish people, you go over here. Are you studying locomotion? You go over here. So it's really, really kind of interesting how it was all grouped. And so for somebody like if you had a specific interest in again, locomotion, you could like just go and watch all these conferences all together and they oh, were nice. like quick 15 minute increments. And that's a very different structure than like educational conferences where it's all one hour or two hours. And then it's very hands on. And so usually at educational conferences, you're not just sitting there, you're like highlighting and then you're doing an interactive activity. So the SIGB was neat, 15 minutes, different presenter, 15 minutes, different presenter, so on, so on. 
How long until we get to the top? Great, thank you. Do it every day. The interaction that I did this morning at four with Camp Invention. Uh, it was a summer camp and it was nothing but little pre K and kindergartners. And it was, they all had those, you know, like the cute little toddler boys. Oh my gosh, they were so cute and they had these ginormous t shirts on because their little bodies just couldn't fill them yet. And then we tried to, like, here, let's just show you some cool videos and then ask us questions. And so all their questions were about sharks. Oh, like yeah. <laughs> no octopus, no shipwrecks, just sharks. How do why do you, and I love the simplicity of their questions. Why do sharks have teeth? Why do they have shark sharp teeth? Do sharks like to eat humans? Why do sharks have fins? Like <laughs> it was so sweet and so innocent. Those sound like questions I could answer. <laughs> I'm glad I had the older group when I did the one yesterday. I don't know how I would have handled that little that those <laughs> set of questions. <laughs> yeah, you had the uh, fourth and fifth graders yesterday. Yeah. Today were the little ones, and then tomorrow I think is first grade and second grade. How many more interactions do we have, or do you have you got for the? Uh, for this particular, oh, for the crews as a as a whole, I don't know. Not that many, because now they're down to like three a day. Okay. So tomorrow we have another camp invention, Texas State Aquarium. So I'm like, both of those are mine, yay! And I'm excited to talk to the Texas State Aquarium again. But not that many, and I got to find out what's going to happen. So the day, uh, so we get into port on the 13th, and then I have an interaction on the 14th for the same camp, just different group of kids. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with that interaction, like. Do we cancel it? Um, does somebody want to stay on board and wake up at 4 a.m. and still do it? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, trying to figure that out. But uh, it's so funny because I'm used to dealing with, with older kids. And so last year, because it's a this camp I'm the camp director of, I'm just not directing it right now. So last year going in, I've never really dealt that much with little ones. That's a whole different ball game. I was, I was very glad that I had one of my instructors was coming to us from the daycare world because she was able to like, when a kid was throwing a tantrum and like on the floor, melting down, kicking and screaming, I'm coming from an older kid point of view, like we don't, we don't touch you. Nope, nope. Yeah. Like you just let them do their thing and you move around them because <laughs> you don't want to touch. And she was like, oh, no. She just picked him up, threw him over her shoulder, and was like, we're not going to do this here, and just carried him <laughs> into the room. <laughs> and, like, it's so funny because I never in a million years would have done that. But it worked. Like, she picked him up, threw him over their shoulder, sat him down in their chair, and they were fine. That was it. <laughs> yeah, that was it. Okay. 
definitely very thankful I don't work too often with the little ones. Like yeah. when I when I do, I have a, all my sixth graders interceding for me. So I'm like, we take them out to the wetlands sometimes about three days a week, depending on the season. And so we get out there. I do like an introduction to all the littles. And it's like a whole group of kindergartners or pre-Kers. And then I'm like, okay, we're going to put you in groups of four. And then we'll have like two sixth graders who watch that group of four. And then I watch my sixth graders and everybody just to make sure nobody's getting hurt or doing something silly. But yeah. <laughs> That sounds exhausting <laughs> from a teaching act. It really is, but it's so great because at the end of the day, you're like, okay, this, uh, yay, I think we planted some, uh, planted that seed correctly in there. Cool. Good. Yeah. And it's, there is something so amazing about like seeing that sense of wonder come out where they're like, oh my gosh, a, a crab, look at this crab. And it's just a little old fiddler crab running across yeah. the ground, but they're so excited. But every little thing is amazing. And yeah. New and, uh, yeah. Every seashell is just like one little tiny piece of a broken oyster shell, which we have a million of. And they're like, right. can I keep this seashell? 100% uh -huh. guys, go for it. The, have you ever taught the, the younger classes or younger grades? Uh, not long term. So when I was getting my master's, um, I was working, I guess, as like a, a helper, like for a kindergarten class that was having a lot of issues. So like their teacher quit within like two weeks, then they got a different, or then they had a whole bunch of subs, they got a different teacher, that teacher got, was pregnant, then they were out on maternity, then they had a different long-term sub, that teacher was like, forget this class, and then, <laughs> so I was like a, they put me and another person in there to kind of like help stabilize the class. Um, so I got to work with this kindergarten group and they were so sweet, so fun. And then I was actually supposed to do pre-K. Like, so that was the area that my master's degree was going to be in was like um, young, like ages three to five, educational or science education. And then it ended up not working out because the teacher quit. I couldn't do uh, the research I needed to do. So I ended up pivoting to a fourth grade classroom. And that's kind of where I've been at upper elementary now, upper elementary and middle school. Nice. And I love it. Yeah. Yeah, it sounds great. I mean, you talk about it quite a bit. And yeah, they're fun. Um, I love them because they cool. they're just starting to get to like that angsty puberty stage. Yeah, right. And I'm like, right when they start getting to that stage, I'm like, Toodaloo. Uh -huh. Have a great time. Uh, I'm done with you this year. <laughs> but for the most part, you can kind of start trusting them to not to like do things on their own. Like they can go to the bathroom by themselves. Yeah. Um, I can trust them to go change in the bathroom. Um, I can ask them to be like, hey, will you go feed the fish? And they can take care of it without dumping the entire fish food in there. Right. Yeah. yeah. I enjoy it. And happy world ocean, guys. Is that today? Yeah, apparently. What is the date? I thought it was tomorrow. tomorrow yeah. Is it? Okay, this is coming in from Indonesia. Oh, it is tomorrow in Indonesia. Indonesia has side of the dateline. And Indonesia saying that they just got a 6.1 earthquake also. Ooh. Check the tsunami forecast. And yeah, we've had a couple of people also saying that uh, Kilauea is active again. All right. Very cool. I thought Kilauea was pretty much always active. I mean, it's always an active volcano, but whether yeah. there's lava actually flowing. Okay. Because I got to see Kilauea like erupting, flowing. And that was like a decade ago. Yeah, that's one of the coolest things I've ever seen in my life, was watching the lava hit the ocean from Kilauea. Mm. When I was in college, we had a really strong outdoor recreation program. And so we did uh, an adventure kind of eco travel to Hawaii. 
And so one of the cool things that we got to do is we hiked up this really cool trail and we got there right as it was starting to sunset so we could watch Kilauea start erupting and then the sunset and you could just see the, the glow from everything, from all the lava. And that was just so incredible. Like borderline spiritual kind of thing. Like, oh wow, nature being rebuilt. <laughs> first time I drove down to Kilauea, I was staying on Kona side, um, and we were driving south, and there was this big cloud, and my wife and I were both had kind of pointed out that um, there was just a strange, large, cumulus cloud hanging out there, and we watched it for like 20 or 30 minutes, and then realized there was steam coming off the volcano. Oh. The realization of, oh no, that's the <laughs> volcano. It is a cloud, but it's coming from the volcano was a funny kind of mind shift. Brian, since you've traveled so much, have you seen any other volcanoes? Um, yes. Um, I saw a small eruption while I was in Indonesia, um, which was actually a pretty amazing story as I was driving the ship. I, we were cutting between two islands. Um, at night, at like I was on the midwatch or something. It was you know the middle of the night. No one else was on, awake on the ship. Really, it was like two people running the sonar and two two of us driving the ship. And we were cutting through this somewhat narrow channel between these islands. And I had it was completely dark. There was no lights on the islands. You know, and I had, we had seen earlier in the day um, a decent amount of small wooden boat traffic in that same channel when we'd gone out and in back into the Pacific from. Um, the celibacy, um, and we we're cutting back through there at night, and so I was worried that these small wooden boats don't show up on radar uh -huh. uh, effectively. So I was had the night vision um, goggles out and was scanning the horizon, looking for any small fishing traffic in the middle of the night. Um, and this giant light, like, just blew up in the night vision and like blinded me. And I dropped the night vision, looked around, and didn't see anything. Uh -huh. And put the night vision back up and didn't see anything and kept looking and then it blew back up again. And this happened a couple times as I was trying to figure out where the light source was that was overwhelming the, um, the night, night vision, vision goggles that I wasn't seeing. And then I realized the top of one of the islands was erupting and it was an infrared flare and it was throwing lava bombs. And so Whoa. if you looked up in the visual spectrum, you could barely just see one little red thing get thrown and then tumble down the hill. But in the infrared spectrum, which the night vision goggles were sensitive to, it was so much heat coming off, it was overwhelming the goggles. Um, and that was really cool. But that's the only other volcano I've ever seen erupting. Oh, man, that sounds amazing. Uh, I had an interaction with Robert Waters, and he was talking about being not in the ROV, but piloting the ROV during the two volcanic, underwater volcanic eruptions that have been captured. Nice. Oh, wow. Yeah. The video from that is pretty amazing. I think I may have only seen the video from one of them, but, but I can only imagine how hard that would be. Because every time I've, we've done ROV work around active vents and stuff like that, it just, it's so, it often is so murky. Like the straight hydrothermal vents aren't, but if you get into the, like the volcanic calderas, it gets so murky so quickly that you just you're you're flying on instruments alone, knowing that there's hot, very dangerous stuff out there for the vehicle. We were um, somewhere. Where were we? Somewhere in the Marianas, trying to work in this caldera, and like we just couldn't do it. We couldn't see anything. We had to abort the dive because it was so turbid in there. Uh, and then I think I wasn't on this cruise, but Okeanos was working. Uh, in one of the volcanoes around Samoa and had the same experience, like they just couldn't function inside the caldera because they couldn't see anything. So I can't imagine getting the conditions to be right in such a way to get up to the actual interface where the lava is cooling and still be able to see it is pretty amazing piloting and navigation. Definitely nerves of steel. I need to ask Annie about um, any volcanic activity around where think, she's from. I think all of it is submerged. 
but there is an active volcano northeast of um, Tutuila, which is the main island in the small American Samoa. I forget, I forget what the actual volcano is called. I don't think there's anything on land still active there. So I'm a nerd and I enjoy watching PBS and they had a Nova documentary about uh, the Tonga volcanic eruption a couple of years ago. Adam's got a proposal trying to get a ship to go there next year. Ooh. Oh, cool. That'd be really cool. So if you were saying that the USGS channel or online channel on YouTube has live footage of Kilauea erupting. And yes, it has always been active, but just no lava for a, for a hot minute, pun intended. Well, that'll be fun. I know several people are headed over to the Big Island when we get back into port next week, so that'll make their trip Ooh. much more interesting. Yeah. yeah. One of my favorite camping trips of all time was inside of a, an extinct caldera. It was out there like Big Bend area of Texas. So it was Big Bend State Park. And so, oh man, it was definitely rough. Like driving through, it took us about four hours to get to our campsite. So you get off the main road, you enter in the park, and then it's four hours of just rough road to get to the campsite. But we didn't see any, another human for two days. Nice. Yeah, and the only reason we saw humans is because we left our campsite to, to go back and get more water from the main headquarters. But it was so beautiful. And then if you hike, so we we're right in the middle of the caldera, but then we would hike around to the rim, and there was gold mines, mercury mines. I mean, they're all discontinued now, but it was really cool hiking up and seeing what these mines look like from way back in the day. Walking around the blast from Mount St. Helens is pretty Ooh. interesting too. Yeah. There's some really cool stuff there. That's that's a sobering experience to go yeah, up there yeah. and realize how big that area is. Yeah, and from 40 plus years ago, and you can still see uh, yeah. the effects of it. It's amazing. Jeez. It erupted, what, about another couple of years ago, didn't it? Like a five years ago? Like just a little one? No? Just the one, was 1980. Okay, 1988 or... 1980. Was it that? Yeah, long it was ago? the year I it erupted a month before I was born. Okay. Okay, yeah, it says the last eruption from Mount St. Helens was 2008 uh, ish. 2008? Huh, yeah, but the major eruption, you're right, uh, 1980, remains the most economically destructive volcanic event in U.S. history. Huh. I did not hear about the 2008 one. I think it was just a little one. Like, it wasn't anything major. Now, I'm trying to look it up specifically. January 16, 2008, steam and seismic activity, but it was not a major eruption and no lava was extruded. Okay. Since I was little, they've been talking about the big one coming, like the big earthquake or the, all the volcanoes <laughs> are going to go up, my rain is going to blow but it hasn't happened yet. So. No. <laughs> and they've been saying the same thing about Californian earthquakes too, right? Yep. <laughs>
So for those online, Brian is going to go downstairs, grab some breakfast, start making sure the samples are ready to be processed. So now we get Adam. Good morning. <laughs> and that was so perfect. <laughs> you guys been on watch for a while? Because I haven't. I just had some coffee and some food. I'm totally excited <laughs> to be here. <laughs> Hey, we made it to the top. Yeah. And just we just about. couldn't stop. Almost to the highest part. Oh, nice. There was some really massive corals just right at the tail end, like on the summit. Oh, massive, really? Massive, yeah. Yeah, they're like three meters high. Whoa. Like cool. land of giants kind of thing. Cool. Maybe we should do another dive just along the summit. Right now? Right now. <laughs> I'm going to let out. you break the news to the ROV team on that <laughs> one. Yeah. Well, that's cool because, you know, at the beginning of the dive, we saw a bunch of stuff we hadn't really seen before because we were deeper. Yeah. Su successful dive. Although, I got to tell you, my watch in the middle was like. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. <laughs> I was going to say, well, we weren't too different. A lot of sand. Mm-hmm. But we did get to see a snailfish. I heard that. that That's super exciting. That, like, iconic deep sea fish. Yeah. yeah. I was telling Paula, like, oh, yeah, that's the one that every couple of years they find a new deepest fish record just, like, uh -huh. six inches below the last one. And she Googled <laughs> it. She's like, yeah, in 2018, in 2019, 2022. <laughs> Good morning. Yeah, so I'm here. Oh, I heard you. <laughs> <laughs> so for those online, it's uh, tail end of the watch, so we are starting to switch over. You get a whole 30 minutes? Yeah. <laughs> kind of like that guy at the airport, you know, who's when the plane's coming in, he's like, I got yeah. it. I'm going to park <laughs> this thing. <laughs> You just do that. Do it well. Uh -huh. Left. Okay. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Adam, we got a question. Do you feel the urge to charter a private private jet and fly over an erupting volcano? Uh. Or yeah. erupted. Yeah, I would. I would charter a helicopter. <laughs> I think that's a much better view. And you can go kind of forwards and backwards and side to side. And I've done that before. Oh. Where was that at? Uh, just in, in Hawaii. Okay. They routinely do volcano overflights just to kind of check things out that are yeah. would take too much time to like walk to Good and there's morning. no roads to. Hey, Annie. Oh, nice. My, yeah, David Okita is the helicopter pilot out there, and he's just... Amazing. Shout out, David Okita. All right. I'll look him up if I go for a helicopter tour. Yeah, yeah. I also heard we're going to Tonga. <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> That'd be a cool cruise to see the underwater. Yeah, not on this ship, though. No. But, uh, yeah, we're trying to get a cruise out to Tonga. That was a pretty amazing eruption, yeah. you know, like uh, once in a lifetime kind of event. Right. So That's really cool. want to see what the impacts were on the seafloor.
<laughs> What's that? That means like pull up on the winch. Oh, yeah, we got that part, but we had other things. Yeah, you added some things? Uh oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> For everybody tuning in online, we are on watch change. 8 to 12 is settling in. Where's the bottom? Hey, Adam, do you know how to make this go? Oh. Split, split screen so it's not just the chat. I did see something that was like below, like it was a, no, I don't know how to do that. So I wanted to add this plus the chat so I could see like the lights, that there's species IDs in there. Yeah. I think it, you won't see the plots, you just see the numbers is how I've seen it, split screen. Okay. Yeah. Um, no, I'll look into it. I think, uh, Leela had it that way, so yes. she must know how to do it. Yeah, I can ask her again. All right. Good morning, 8 to 12. How's everybody feeling this beautiful, what day is it, Wednesday morning? <laughs> good. I feel good. That's good. That's great. I'll speak on behalf of everyone. We feel great. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> Hey Adam, did you hear? I um, think Hale Mau Mau erupted again. Really? On Big Island? I did not hear. I mean, it's had uh, kind of a lava lake for many years. Yeah, I saw um, the news this morning. Kilauea volcano has begun erupting again at yes. Hale Mau Mau Crater. Sweet. Pele has returned. All right. Is it just filling up a lava lake, or is it actually kind of putting... It's actually, from what I saw, there was a huge... Is there a fountain? Yeah. Oh, wow. dang. Well, it that volcano was erupting continuously for 30 years. Wow. And then Ooh, in 2018, what? had a, a big eruption in kind of a new spot, and then quieted down for you know, essentially till now. So, the, you know, the fact that it can erupt continuously for 30 years means there's just continuous input of new magma into that right. system. And so uh, taking a break for a few years and ready to keep it going, hopefully, because, you know, being able to like walk on lava flows is like, it's just epic, you know? So. I, I just want everyone to have that opportunity. I know when it um, when I was on Big Island a couple of years ago and it erupted. Um, <laughs> um, there was a point where the they were looking for the magma, the magma or the lava um, was just gone. It went underground. Oh yeah. Yeah. So everyone was concerned. Mm-hmm trying to find out where is it going to pop yeah, up next yeah yeah oh cool i have a bunch of friends out there at the volcano observatory i'll have to get the inside scoop oh oh and then we have our viewers asking um have you seen any volcanic eruptions, Dave? 
He? Yes. No. Uh, I've been to the Big Island several times. I've walked on uh, lava fields and uh, been up to the national park and seen steam vents and that kind of stuff, but haven't oh. seen anything. But in 2018, uh, when Kilauea did uh, erupt and Who? came down the side of the mountain, uh, Nautilus was there just right offshore, uh, and we uh, did a quick mapping pass or three uh, to see how much inundation there'd been with the, the new lava flow. What it covered up on the seafloor, how Deck far out. Deck fan, radio check. And oh, it was wow. still, it was still steaming and smoking. Copy. Yeah, we were set to the wrong channel. Good now. Oh, Nautilus was on um, Big Island. Yeah. 2018. Yeah, we were. What? Uh, yeah, we were just offshore, uh, Captain Cook area, south of Hilo, and. Uh, mapping the, the new lava flow. Oh, wow. And I was there on Big Island. It was on my last year of UH Hilo. Mm-hmm. What was that, Bob? You're not on SPL. There we go. I was on a cruise. We pulled into Papua, uh, Rabul, Papua New Guinea. Yeah. And the volcano was erupting as we were coming in. And we were getting ash and pumice on the ship. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the, the volcano is like really close to the main town too. You gotta watch out because, you know, you can there's a bunch of water intakes right to cool the engines and stuff. You could uh, suck all that stuff in. Yeah. Yeah. But there was people went on a on a. A trip up the mountain because it was kind of like light eruptions, uh -huh. but they were actually giving tours up the volcano. Oh my gosh! And they, it erupted. They're giving the tours. Day. Yeah, they were giving tours. What? And then people, <laughs> yeah, people went up there, and the next day it really erupted. <laughs> the town's been wiped out several times, and for some reason, I guess just because of how nice a port it is, mm, they yeah. keep rebuilding there. <laughs> They had to relocate the airport because it got lava flow over it. <laughs> oh, wow. Oh, we have our viewers tuning in from Glassboro, New Jersey. Nice. I hear your <laughs> pilot likes to be called Jersey Mike. <laughs> 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 He doesn't <laughs> just like it. He, he loves it. <laughs> Get out of here. <laughs> I just want to extend a formal invitation to our viewers in Glassboro, New Jersey, to tune in every 8 to 12 watts. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, look up to the camera up there. Say uh, hi. <laughs> Say hi, everybody. <laughs> I know exactly <laughs> who wrote that in. <laughs> Rachel, thank you. Oh. <laughs> That's actually the mayor of Glassboro. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she might be. <laughs> uh, she might be. In time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> She's the mayor of Mike's part of Glassboro. Exactly. Right? <laughs> <laughs> she likes watching me suffer and squirm. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So, what are we at? 700 meters. Prime giant squid territory, maybe? Stop. Oh, <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Did we have any creatures um, kind of, I don't be curious about Big Herc, but like try to attack Big Herc? Big Herc? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, we've got a lot of sharks who are interested. Right, right. Yeah. There's a good story about Alvin uh, was attacked by a sailfish, you know, like a swordfish thing. Oh, oh So intensely that it it got its... Uh, sword? Sword, yeah, stuck between a couple, I don't know, The pieces. skins. The yeah. skins. What? The fiberglass skins. And yeah. it came up with the, with the sub. And they headed for it dinner. It came up? <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Then what happened? What happened to the selfish? <laughs> it was dinner. It was dinner. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
what you get. <laughs> that's what you get. <laughs> but those fish can be pretty aggressive, I think, generally yeah. speaking, yeah. I mean, if you got, if you had a sword on your nose, I think everyone would be trying to fight you. Yeah. So you just end up. <laughs> You're trying way. to fight everyone. <laughs> uh oh. Were there people inside the Alvin when this happened? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that must be so scary. I was having a fish. Were you inside Alvin when this no, happened? No, that was that was like the '60s or '70s, really oh, wow. long time ago. So did all of our samples get filled up? Uh, Sampling containers. We might believe so. Uh, yeah, I think they took the sheets. So yeah, they, they, they. Oh wow! That's oh. The, the sample. We'll log. never know. They <laughs> say no, don't, no, no <laughs> more. Surprise! No. Core two cut one off. ever get actually filled. <laughs> <laughs> or was core two one just left alone? The band core two. That's a yeah. It's kind of like a ghost story for that one. Actually, the. The furthest one's the hardest. Oh, yeah. You start getting tilted over too much. <coughs> oh. I guess it might help to have those, like, on little swing arms, yeah? yeah well, except where are you going to tuck them into? From, just from that spot to have them kind of extend out from the basket. I think you'd end up with them hanging outside the frame and getting bashed around though, right? Well, not if you retracted them. Well, you can't, the box is there. You can't retract it where the box is. Uh, I'm, I have, mechanically, I see it in my mind, but maybe, <laughs> it's, maybe it's not. Okay, uh, you point it out to me. All right. And I'll dash all your dreams. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Robert lives for this. <laughs> oh, fish. Jason has trouble with tube cores in the uh, on the swing arms because they sometimes they float out of the quivers and then it jams the. The oh. swing arm up, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks like you got some bad wraps on the winch there on the left side. Yeah, we've had those for a while. Thank you uh, for pointing that one <laughs> out. <there. laughs> First glass barrel, and uh, now you want to point out the bad wraps on the winch? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it all morning. <laughs> that seems like a problem for deck mic. It looks though. much worse uh, in this uh, view than it does on the drum yeah. view, though. You know? Yeah. Oh yeah, look at that. Yeah. That is uh, definitely a deck mic problem. <laughs> <laughs> I think every day we get a different like piece of the winch or the line cam. I think that's gets as, revealed. As, the, as the ice melts. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best so far, I think. Is that because it's down too low, or? It's getting water in the housing. I think. It's broken. Oh, I see. It needs to be replaced. Sorry, Dave. I was gonna say, there's just, <laughs> Sorry, they're Dave. They're on fire <laughs> this morning, <laughs> we just pointed out. You stuff like, oh. my spare. If video didn't have deck cams to work on, they wouldn't have anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, uh, ROV Mon 1 up there, Mon 2 up there is gonna be a problem. Oh, yeah. boy. Yeah, when you're in blue water, that line shows Cinedec up B clearly. failed again, so we're down to one Cinedec recorder. Oh, gosh. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Um, okay. So, 
Pretty soon we're going to have to be drawing that. pictures. Yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a lot of post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> so working on that, yeah, nothing to do. <laughs> So in all the different winch shots in that kind of like grid on the left, yeah. what's the upper left one? Is that from the... That's between the, the two uh, block and tackle. Uh, oh, okay. Like looking at, the, there's like five wires looking across. So you're looking for a sag in the wires. Oh, like I they see. should all be like, mm -hmm. so that you only see one. They should all be even. Right. So if... Oh, so it looks like one, but there's yeah, multiple but there's, in there. Yeah, there's five of them. You can see it on the left-hand side where they're going up. There's like 